This is African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello, welcome to VO Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Douglas Impuga, and here is what's coming up. In order to better serve their interests, as soon as they took power in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Chad, the military government tried to control the media by means of prohibition or restriction and even attacks and arbitrary arrests. That's Adibo Marong, West African Director for Reporters Without Borders, about the impact of military regimes on media freedoms. Also, aid groups seek funds for those hit hard by Cyclone Freddy in Malawi. Health officials in Mozambique are struggling to contain the spread of cholera in the wake of the storm. And many Christians are making Holy Week, are marking Holy Week ahead of Easter next Sunday. All this and more coming up on African News Tonight. Policy analysts say structural inequities continue to hamper efforts by non-profit actors in Africa to improve infrastructure development on the continent. The analysts urge stakeholders to use a tailor-made approach to help Africa tackle its problems. VOA's Ignatius Arno reports for, from Washington. African countries are among the leading recipients of foreign development aid. And aid policy analysts say it is important to increasingly localize aid programs. Chingwe Efion is chief program officer at Global Given. She says, for instance, a United States agency for international development program, the negotiated indirect cost rate agreement, or NICRA, undercuts African non-governmental organizations. The NICRA is a negotiated interest rate, which is the overhead that nonprofits need to run their business. So most international NGOs can claim a NICRA of up to 40% to pay their salaries, to pay the rents, and you know all the operational costs. African NGOs in particular are capped at 10%, even though in most situations they're doing 90% of the work. So right there is a, very, a, bl- a glaring inequity that is staring us right in the face but not being addressed. A recent Washington forum brought together eight experts to address some of the key challenges bedeviling the continent of 1.4 billion people. USAID says it has begun reforms to address the issues raised. Muel Din Omar is USAID's Africa Bureau Senior Advisor. He told VOA that by 2025, its first goal is to provide 25% of its budget directly to local non-profits in Africa, compared with the current 7%. The second target is 50% of our programming will place local actors in the lead within the decade. That's seven years from now. So that's the goal, and that would require doing two things. One, reforming the agency in itself to be able to directly work with local actors to not only observe observe this funds that we're talking about, 25%, but also to do the work in a very meaningful way that would impact these local communities. As some African leaders look for an equal Western partnership, is foreign aid still the future for the continent? Fiwakule Nguando is a professor of African studies at Harvard University in Washington. You come from certain countries that are quite poor in the African con- on the African continent. Yes, it is. So there is still a need. We would be lying to ourselves if we said there's, st- there's not a need for aid. However, we are unlearning some things. We're learning basically that there is an Africa that no longer needs aid but needs partnerships, needs business opportunity. And they, even a, as there is still an Africa that needs all the aid it can get. James Winkler is the vice president of Creative Associates International. We need to um, program foreign aid differently. There are times when uh, humanitarian assistance because of starvation or uh, disasters or a pandemic requires assistance to help our African brothers and sisters that need immediate help, and they can't do it by themselves. Foreign participants included students, academics, and professionals who made a case that the social, cultural, and economic interests of African countries should be considered when foreign partners initiate development programs. Ignatius Anno, VOA News, Washington. (music) 
The United Nations and humanitarian partners in Malawi are calling for $70 million to help more than a million people who were affected by Cyclone Freddy. The storm, which also hit Mozambique and Madagascar, killed 676 people and displaced more than 650,000 in southern Malawi. The UN says the flash appeal will provide shelter, nutrition, health, water, and sanitation for those hardest hit by the crisis. Lameka Masina reports from Blantyre, Malawi. The fresh appeal comes on top of the 45.3 million US dollars called for earlier this year by humanitarian partners to respond to a cholera outbreak, bringing the total revised fresh appeal to 115.9 million US dollars. The UN says the funds would be enabled to work swiftly in support of the Malawi government-led response to assist communities affected by cyclone freedom and cholera. UN resident coordinator in Malawi, Rebecca Adadonto, said Malawians have mobilized to support one another in this time of tremendous need and the appeal aimed to step up solidarity as the international community. The cyclone destroyed many bridges and cut off roads in Malawi, making many areas only reachable by boats and aircraft. Government statistics show that the cyclone left at least 676 people dead and the death toll is expected to rise as more than 600 others are still missing. Warani Chilenga is the chairperson for the Committee on Natural Resources and Climate Change in Malawi's parliament. He says the devastation caused by the cyclone would have been less had the country done a better job of managing its natural resources. We have lost almost all the forests. Uh, our land is degraded. So what we are going to do as a committee, or what we have already started doing, is to lobby the government to come up with the deliberate policies where they should uh, distribute these gas stops to people living in cities and towns. Because if you look at the market of chaff, it is found in cities. The committee donated the gas-powered stoves to cyclone victims living in a camp in Blanta on Sunday to dissuade them from using charcoal. If we can't do that, then these calamities are here to stay and each year out, year in, we shall be coming here donating food items to people staying in camps, which is not uh, what we want as malaria. The UN says in a statement that the appeal aims to provide an integrated response, including shelter, nutrition, health, water, sanitation, and hygiene and protection for those hardest hit by the crisis. Reverend Moses Chimpepo is the Director for Preparedness for the Department of Disaster Management Affairs in Malawi. He says the government is now working on helping survivors move away from disaster-prone areas and start a new life. We are trying to come up with a package and mobilize enough resources and then give it to the city council so that they can give to those people who are willing to move. With the maize that the government is providing, with this food that the government is providing, we are trying to put together a package. In the meantime, Malawi Vice President Saulos Chirima has asked city authorities in Blanta to override a court ruling that allowed residents to build unauthorized homes in hilly areas. Thousands of people in Blanta had their houses washed away and hundred others were killed when Cyclone Freddy caused mudslides on hills in Chilogwe Township. Lamek Masina for VOA News, Blanta, Malawi. Health officials in Mozambique are struggling to contain the spread of cholera in the wake of Cyclone Freddy. The Associated Press says over 19,000 cases of the illness have been confirmed across eight of Mozambique's provinces. The Minister of Health says more than 3,200 people were hospitalized in Zambezia province alone. The AP says among the hardest hit are homes that rely on water from communal wells contaminated by flooding and sewage overflows. For now, health workers are providing homes with Sateza, a chlorine-based purifier. Flooding and humidity are also breeding swarms of mosquitoes carrying malaria. The flooding also put harvests at risk and has carried seawater inland, threatening fertility in areas already suffering from malnutrition. 
Burkina Faso's government has expelled two French journalists following publication of a report about alleged child executions in the military barracks. The move is the latest in a crackdown on French media by the West African country's military junta. Anika Hamashlag reports from Dakar, Senegal. Liberation correspondent Agnès Fevre and Le Monde reporter Sophie Douce were summoned by Burkina Bay military authorities for questioning Friday and later given 24 hours to leave. The pair arrived in Paris Sunday. Burkina Faso's ruling military junta has given no reason for the expulsions. Reports say there was no comment from the French foreign ministry. In a statement, Liberation said the junta was angered by its March 27th report about an investigation into a video that showed a soldier killing children and adolescents. According to Liberation, social media reports say Burkina Bay officials accused Fevre and Douce of infiltrating the country and of being paid to create false testimonies. The newspaper said Burkina Faso's restrictions on the freedom to inform are a sign of a power that does not allow its actions to be questioned. The Burkina Bay government also suspended broadcaster France 24 on March 27th and suspended Radio France International in December. Sedi Boumourang is the West Africa director for Reporters Without Borders. Military junta's have not hesitated to reshape the media landscape in order to better serve their interests. As soon as they took power in Mali, in Burkina Faso and in Chad, the military government tried to control the media by means of prohibition or restriction and even attacks and arbitrary arrests. They've also implemented complex media accreditation processes, Morong added. This hamper journalistic work and do not respect the principle of journalists being able to protect the identity of their sources. A report on press freedom by Reporters Without Borders released Monday found five journalists have been killed in the Sahel over the last 10 years and hundreds have been threatened. Recently, two others have gone missing. Security and instability have become worse in West Africa as countries deal with a spreading Islamist militant insurgency. Burkina Faso saw two military coups in 2022. Heads of state in Chad, Guinea, and Mali have also been forcefully removed in recent years. Annika Hammerschlag for VOA News, Dakar, Senegal. You are listening to African News Tonight. I'm Douglas Impuga in Washington. A court in Algeria has sentenced a prominent journalist five years in prison with two years suspended for threatening state security. Ishane El Kadi was accused of receiving foreign funding for a radio station and a website. The AP says the media company that owns both platforms was ordered dissolved and its assets seized. It was also fined $7,300. El Kadi was active in Algeria's Iraq government. In 2019, the latest people charged in a government crackdown on dissenting voices. The AP says the case against him is linked to the crowd crowdfunding used to finance his media outlets, Maghreb Emergent and Web Radio. Neither were recognized as official media organizations. Kenyan, op- Kenyan opposition leader Raila Dinga called off an anti-government protest scheduled for today, saying he was ready for negotiations following an appeal from President William Ruto. Kenya's top prosecutor dropped charges against four lawmakers today over anti-government protests, according to their lawyer. VOA's, Ni- VOA's Nairobi correspondent, Maria Madialo, tells me that the city was calm and that people expect the two principles to reach some compromise. I think everyone, it's safe to say, that is breathing a sigh of relief. I think you can tell uh, from the attitudes, uh, when I look at people today, they felt relaxed, somehow relieved that there is at least a temporary truce. Uh, I think coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact that uh, basically the Ukrainian war has been having on uh, many countries' economies, I think people seem to not want to see another prolonged uh, demonstrations because, as Ruto said yesterday, the two-week, three-day protests have cost Kenya not only its image, but the widespread violence, the looting, the invasion of private property, Uh, he said yesterday, had seriously affected everyone, especially businesses. Uh, But on the other hand, the opposition has also um, had accused the government and the police uh, for use of excessive force. I think last week, Odinga, uh, during a press conference, actually claimed that his uh, convoy uh, was attacked. 
and his car was hit uh, with seven live bullets, each of them aimed at him. Uh, I watched basically uh, when he explained that to uh, reporters that uh, basically aimed at him when him and his supporters were exercising, all they were doing was, was basically exercising their democratic rights. Uh, so the, I think the fact that President Ruto extended uh, an olive branch and also making some concessions, including the, the suggestion of that bipartisan engagement in Parliament uh, regarding the reconstitution uh, of the IEBC panel, I think it was a, a positive development, as Odinga said yesterday. And because of that, that's the reason why, uh, at least one of the reasons uh, that he called off uh, today's pro protest. One of Mr. Odinga's uh, demands was that th those who are arrested and charged for these protests be the charges be dropped, and that has happened today. That must be a good sign about what we can see in the future. Yes, there are uh, absolute, there are reports that the, the director of public prosecution um, has dropped criminal charges against four to six, uh, I believe, lawmakers affiliated uh, with the Azimio coalition party, which is Odinga. Uh, they had been charged of taking uh, part in this, uh, what they deemed were uh, basically unauthorized uh, uh, demos. I think the prosecution said that the move is to create an environment for peace and dialogue. Uh, which was obviously uh, initiated yesterday uh, by the Kenyan president and uh, the opposition leader, uh, Raila Odinga. There are also reports from what I'm seeing uh, that the DPP is set to maybe withdraw uh, other cases. I believe uh, they're talking about 200 cases against uh, protesters arrested during the, the entire uh, government demos. I guess we'll update you on that uh, when we get more information. What do we know about the pending meeting between the two parties? I, I don't think I don't have a lot of uh, information on that, uh, but uh, what I, I, I guess a lot can happen within the week. But I would also say uh, I believe a week deadline is short. As we know, uh, yesterday Odinga had said that if he doesn't see meaningful engagement from President Bruto, uh, he reserves the right to get out uh, him and his, uh, his supporters to protest again uh, next Monday. So we will have to wait uh, and see. Hopefully this bipartisan group that was proposed uh, will make some progress. I also didn't hear much about what the president uh, was going to do about the high cost of living uh, during his speech yesterday, uh, which was one of the main reasons the opposition said it was uh, for them for organizing the protest. So if a lot happened over the weekend, I hope as much or more can happen within this week and we might not see another protest for a while. Uh, it's hard to say what would happen, obviously. Uh, we're just watching everything uh, closely and uh, hopefully the dialogue that started will continue. That was VOA's Nairobi correspondent, Mariama Diallo. She spoke with me from Nairobi. <music> Former U.S. President Donald Trump will be in New York City tomorrow to be arraigned for after a grand jury indicted him on criminal charges. The indictment of a former president is unprecedented in U.S. history. The exact charges are not yet known as the indictment remains sealed. The former president denies the allegations and says political enemies are persecuting him. VOA New York City correspondent Tina Trin is at the courthouse today in Manhattan, New York, she spoke earlier with my colleague, Kurt Pound Dawson. Right now uh, in downtown Manhattan, outside of the Manhattan DA's office, we're seeing a lot of the same stuff that we've seen uh, throughout the, the past uh, week and a half or so, um, meaning a large police presence on the ground, um, a lot of uh, block streets, a lot of metal the metal barricade that kind of reroute uh, pedestrian traffic uh, around the scene. So uh, more than anything else, just a huge media presence. Uh, all the major outlets are out in full force and, and ready to uh, just get any additional information and ready to, to pounce when they can uh, on potentially uh, the next Trump sighting. He has uh, been away from New York uh, for uh, a little while now, and uh, to come back in, in this fashion is, is definitely a unique turn in his story. Um, he is uh, definitely a, a New York boy who grew up in, in Queens and, and came to make it big in, in Manhattan. What is known about the schedule for his arraignment and court appearance tomorrow? Has, has there been a timeline published by the district attorney's office? So reports are saying that he will be arriving uh, midday sometime tomorrow. 
um, and he will be booked, fingerprinted, and photographed, um, and then he will uh, be able to hear the charges formally presented uh, to him and be able to plead guilty or not guilty, and he is uh, planning on traveling to New York today uh, in order to make this arraignment uh, proceedings tomorrow. He will be staying at Trump Tower at his uh, Trump Tower building in Midtown Manhattan. As far as we know, everything should be pretty straightforward. Uh, He is expected to make remarks uh, after the proceedings, and that will actually take place in Florida, uh, reports are saying, uh, at Mar-a-Lago once he returns uh, from New York. Are there any protests expected tomorrow or even today? Yes, tomorrow on Tuesday, uh, we expect that the New York Young Republican Club will be holding a protest at noon uh, nearby across from the uh, criminal courts building in lower Manhattan uh, at a park across the street. So they will be gathering to show support for the former president and Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene is also expected to to attend this rally. That was viewer correspondent uh, Tina Trin in New York. She spoke with editor Kate Pounderson. As you heard, Trump's arraignment is tomorrow. We'll have an update on the case on Africa News tonight, and you can find more on voafrica.com or on voanews.com. Many Christians are marking Holy Week ahead of Easter next Sunday. In Rome yesterday, Pope Francis celebrated Palm Sunday at the Vatican, the start of Holy Week for Roman Catholics. Thousands of people waved palm and olive branches as Francis was driven into the Vatican a day after leaving a hospital where he was treated for bronchitis. Per partecipare alla gloria della risurrezione, egli è Dio. Speaking in Italian, Pope Francis gives a blessing to the faithful at the Vatican. He says they take part in the glory of the resurrection of God, who is on with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit for all the centuries and centuries. Amen. In Nigeria, hundreds of people took part in a Palm Sunday procession in Lagos. Outside the Holy Cross Cathedral, the Reverend Raymond Emedo talks about the procession. The procession on Palm Sunday is very important in Christendom because it signals for us the beginning of the Holy Week when we celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus. On this day, many years ago, Jesus walked the streets of Jerusalem and he was heralded as the King of the Jews. But for us as Christians today, we salute and recognize him not just as King of the Jews, but the King of the whole world, our own King, the one who is the Prince of Priests. In Jerusalem, thousands of Christians from around the world took part in the annual Palm Sunday procession. This woman gave her name as Evelyn. She's from Guatemala, but lives in Israel, where she guides Christian pilgrims to holy sites. The importance is huge because we are Christians and we want to to show to everybody that we are here and that we are celebrating after 2,000 years the same day, the same procession, and the presence of all of us is very important today. Holy Week ends on, Sun, on Easter when Christians believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead after being executed by the Romans. Orthodox Christians, however, celebrate Easter a week later on April 16th. And that wraps up this edition of African News Tonight.